Namat Pranams to you all. Dear friends, dear devotees, please accept my obeisance. <clears throat> so we are gathered here in this auspicious place under the shelter Shishirad Haramanju, Guru Pada Padma Shila Prabhupada, trying to practice some sadhana. Yes, Shesha agrees. <clears throat> so he says, practicing sadhana with us. Something I was talking about recently, I had a meeting with some friends and people in London. The idea of how we kind of talk about spiritual life as a, something separate. I call it othering. I don't know, they have that in like context, right? Othering somebody. Oh, it's like separate. Spiritual life is something separate from life. I would argue that spiritual life is in fact life. No, 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 we're just starting. Haribo Kirtan. We're just uh, hanging out, talking, and saying Kirtan's going to come any moment here. Rade, Jaiho. So, <clears throat> now we're ready to begin. So we're discussing a very interesting conversation. It's a conversation within a conversation, as many of the best ones are. This conversation is between Sri Krishna. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is described as the Supreme Personality by himself, by Arjuna, by all the different sages, and also by Lord Brahma and all in different scriptures, Krishna is described as Supreme Personality. So Krishna, the Supreme Personality, is sitting with his very close friend and also someone who acted as an advisor in his kingdom, Sri Uddhava. And this is in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavat Puran, considered the crest jewel of Vedic literature, the ripened fruit of all Vedic knowledge. There are so many glories of the Bhagavat Puran, which we will hear at another time. So here, Krishna has told his friend that he's leaving the world. And then he says, you have to stay. So that's the beginning of the conversation. Imagine, you're Krishna's, one of Krishna's best friends. It's described that Uddhava is so dear to Krishna. He's like dearer to him than Krishna's own potency, his own Shankarshan, Shakti, his own brother almost it said he's so dear to him and Krishna is saying I'm going to leave and Uddhava says okay great let's go spiritual world the spiritual world what is the spiritual world what is the material world we talk about spiritual life as something separate from life this is called illusion spiritual life is just life life is spirit life is sacred life is divine but we become covered over with attachment to everything separate from the spirit that is what is called material life but spiritual life in the sanat and dharma conception which is the eternal path isn't separate all aspects of life become spiritual if they're properly aligned whether one is in family life or in the renounced order or in student life whether one is engaged in different trades or vocations or various pursuits because one is aligned with the center of which is God and also one is properly situated in understanding divine knowledge then everything becomes truly spiritual we don't have this distinction spiritual and material life you never hear this in Hindi or Sanskrit I've never heard it oh you're following spiritual life you're following material life Matter is called Jud, inert, and spirit is called Chit, conscious. So anything that is conscious, that is life, anything that is inert or dead, that is material. So what is material life? It is simply attachment to that which is not spirit. But in the essence of everything, spirit is present. So it's a form of illusion. What is composing everything in the world? It's all, sp it's all energy and spirit. Consciousness and energy. And matter is there. 
That's right. But we're absorbed in it, separate from understanding of the essence, the spirit. Therefore, we become engaged in material life. A symptom of people in material life is that they talk about spiritual life. Someone who's a materialist talks about spiritual life. <laughs> Why? Because a real spiritualist, everything is spiritual life. I've never heard our guru talk about, oh, I'm practicing spiritual life. Everything is spiritual life. Waking up in the morning, going to the bathroom, this is spiritual life. <laughs> what does Krishna say? Whatever you do, offer it to the spirit, to the center, to me, then it becomes spiritual, connected to the spirit. Every part of your life can become spiritual life. It, then it just becomes life. This is Krishna's associates in the spiritual world, Vrindavan. Spiritual world just means where that dead matter and illusion and ignorance is not present. Everything is divine. Everything is conscious. And there they're not thinking, okay, this part of the day is for spiritual life. This part of the day is for material life. Krishna doesn't go out with the coward boys and say, all right, now we have to go do our job, and in the evening we're going to come home and practice spiritual life. Oh, what else do we do in spiritual life? We learn how to put our leg behind our head, <laughs> stand on our head, right? We're contorting matter and calling it spiritual. Doing asanas is spiritual. What is it that is spiritual? What is it that is material? How do we understand? Life itself is spiritual. That's the basic proposition. Krishna says in Chatur Sloki Bhagavatam, the four essential verses, it says that actually only that which you see as separate from Krishna is Maya. But the realized soul sees that everything is connected to God. Everything is coming from God. And so as a true spiritualist or Vedantist, you can be in family life, renounced life, any kind of vocational activity, and you can be practicing paramartik. Or paramartha, actually we don't call it spiritual in Hindi, we call it paramartha, which means understanding the highest value, the highest thing in the world and striving towards that. So anyhow, this is something, a bone I have to pick. Spiritual life and material life. Spiritualist, it's like a bird's in the air flying. They're not thinking I'm in the air flying, they're just living like a fish in the water, it's just living and breathing water. So true spiritualist, everything is spiritual. For a materialist, we have to struggle very hard to practice a little bit of spiritual life. So Krishna is sitting with Uddhava and he's prepared to leave this world. <laughs> Hello, are you matter or spirit? I, I didn't know my computer was named Uddhava. I must be Lochan's user. Okay. So imagine this Krishna is sitting with Uddhava and he tells Uddhava, I'm leaving. Oh, great, I get to come? No, you must stay. He becomes very upset and he says, Krishna, what will I do? When you are here, everything has purpose. We work hard for you. Spiritual life, we work hard for you when you are here. When you go, what is the point? Krishna says, yes, sannyas is good. Renunciation is good. And then Uddhava says, actually, renunciation is a very nice idea, but very hard to practice. So Uddhava says, oh, renounce, renouncing. It's a very lofty idea, right? Give up attachment. Give up everything. Just wander around like a, I don't know, like a, like a bug, <laughs> like a ladybug. <laughs> Renunciation. But 
Krishna responds saying that actually this is why this is why I'm trying to connect spirit and matter. Fourth verse again of Chatur Sloki, four verses of Bhagavatam. It says that a true transcendentalist should seek the absolute everywhere in everything directly and indirectly. And they should search for that. And so Krishna also says this to Uddhava. He says, actually, one thing he says, we should recognize the guru within, which is the super soul, conscience, paramatma. No coughing in class. That's <laughs> oh, right. That was a very dignified, polite, yeah. <clears throat> right, ladylike. Yes, like a lady, lady bird. So, he says that within this human body, the living beings can search out the Supreme Lord by both positive and negative means and ultimately achieve him. So in other words, we can find the spirit everywhere and we can take instruction everywhere if we're in their mindset to do that. And because human form of life is possible for that, it's considered very dear to the Supreme Lord. Human form of life is very valuable. How much is it worth? People take other human beings hostage to try to figure out how much is the human body worth. Right? How much is it worth? If you think from childhood, we work very hard, right, for money. How much is it worth this human form of life? You can put a price on it. I'm worth this much. No. It's priceless. Labdva sudurlabam bahusam bhavante. We are not a ladybug. We are not a butterfly. We are not an ant or a firefly. We are human beings. And it's a very valuable form of life. Priceless. Why? If you were to go to a dolphin or a shark, or a spider and say, would you like to become a human being? Doesn't even understand what you're saying. But if you were to say, okay, it will take you 1,500,064 lives. How valuable is the human form of life? Now we are human beings. And not only are we human beings, but we are interested in understanding our nature, our spirit and relationship with God. So Krishna describes an ancient conversation between a Brahmin, mendicant, avadut. Avadut is something that means someone who is beyond all social constraints. You cannot categorize them or box them in anything. They're just a wandering madman or madwoman. They don't even know the difference between man and woman. Sukadev Goswami, who's speaking the Bhagavatam, he was walking naked as a 16-year-old young man, completely even unaware of himself. There's many stories about this. So the point here is that Avadut is someone who is completely beyond any material conception of life. He was traveling here and there in great transcendental ecstasy, and he was acting unpredictably. Sometimes people become like that, as if he was being haunted by a ghost. So if you ever see me wandering around, hmm muttering to myself, you, should, you can call the cops, because I'm not an Avadut, I'm just mad. <laughs> All right, so this Avadut spoke with the king. Hmm. So there's a king and a holy man, and the king meets this wandering holy man who appears mad, but blissful. Our Gurudev would say, who's happy in this world? Two kinds of people. The person who's laying in the gutter outside the pub. What you call what would you call that? Uh, Drunkard. No, like when they're completely plastered. And the dog is urinating on their face, in their mouth. And they're dreaming, fa uh, fantasizing about being a great enjoyer, a great king in heaven, and drinking this hot rum. <laughs> the hot I don't know what Cider? beer tastes like but I don't know if it tastes like hot dog urine anyhow 
He was drinking this and he was ha very happy in that moment because he was completely mad. Gurudev would say, you can see that mad people, if they eat or they may just be happy without any reason or they may be disturbed without any reason. So the king asked about his state. Specifically, why did he appear so ecstatic? So this is very interesting. This is Krishna's story to Uddhava after telling him he has to stay in this world. And the Avadut says that he has 24 different gurus. 24 gurus. You imagine he got fire ceremonies with each one. You hear the different gurus and then you can consider. All right. Because of the knowledge that he had gained from these gurus, he was able to travel the earth in a liberated state. Like Mangala Gita. <laughs> He's traveling. <laughs> Completely liberated. First guru. What is the first guru? The earth. Mm. From the earth he learned how to be sober. Dhira. Dhira. Rupa Goswami says we should learn to control our urges so that we can become Dhira, sober. Why do we learn to control our speech? People want freedom, freedom. Freedom is the most important thing in this world, right? Yes, freedom is important, but our sages tell us that learning to control your urges is even more powerful and valuable. Then you can become Dita and you can actually be a teacher, a ruler of the earth. So the earth is our first teacher. Why? The earth is always sober. The earth is mother earth, right? Imagine you have a few kids, you become very sober. Imagine you have 8 billion human kids and trillions and trillions of ant kids. <laughs> and imagine all the other living species on earth. Imagine Jai Shri, huh? Oof. One Narayani. <laughs> So much sobriety is required. <laughs> Imagine everyone on your surface of your earth. Not only that, you have to love all your kids, but some of your kids, oof. Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Joe Biden. Imagine some of your kids. Yeah. Mother Earth says that so many people have tried to rule me, and I simply watch them like little kids you know, building sand castles and fighting over them and then the waves come and take it away and they're fighting over this. But it's also temporary. And Mother Earth sings in the end of the Bhagavatam that this is all just such a childish display, actually. All this fighting over position and power. It's all just childish displays of uh, the ego. So from the earth, this sage learned how to be sober. And he mentioned two things about the earth, the mountain and the tree. From the mountain and the tree, he learned how to serve others and how to dedicate one's whole life to the benefit of others. Wow. Look at that Mother Earth. What is she providing? Part of the reason I wanted to touch on this topic is because, you know, when we're living in cities, we lose touch a little bit with Mother Earth. When we're in nature, we're naturally more close to her. And we should also remember how important she is and also how much we can learn from Mother Earth. And these 24 gurus, we wouldn't be able to learn from them if, you know, we didn't, he didn't find these gurus in New York City. They were in nature. So it's the importance of nature itself and honoring and serving Mother Nature. You'll hear he learns from a, a moth, he learns from different birds. He learns from so many different parts of nature. Here he's saying he learned from the mountains and from the trees how to serve others, like the mountains, providing minerals, providing so many things. And from the trees, giving one's whole life for the benefit of others. This is a it's this way of life or a state of being. The mentality of when we wake up, 
what can I do today for my family, for my community, for society, for God, and also for myself? I should also serve, take care of this body that's been given to me. So this is the idea of service. From the wind, manifesting it as my life heirs. So you see one of the gurus is the wind, but not the wind outside, the wind within, the inner wind. So how do we learn from that? We learn how to be satisfied merely keeping ourselves alive. <laughs> right? I can practice that one. <laughs> we should learn to be satisfied merely keeping ourselves alive. Because the vital air is what is keeping ourselves uh, us alive. And from the external wind, he learned how to remain uncontaminated by the body and the objects of the senses. The air is purifying. Pavitra. What do you guys think? Any comments up to this point? Different gurus? Wow. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's the name of God is breath, basically. So that in our breath, God is always there. Come <laughs> so, I, I just learned that. that was cool. All right, let's practice that together. <laughs> Yahweh. <laughs> Yahweh. No, How do you do it? Say no vowels. You just <laughs> How do you say it? Yeah. Yeah. So breath is God. Breath is God. That's what Vedanta says, actually. It says pran. Brahma, Pranamai Brahma. It's one of the gods. That means it's one of the expansions. And the original breath of God from which comes all of existence and with his inhalation, everything withdraws. And in that brief span in between, we're all playing this game of material life in this existence. So, is that, that's like a Gnostic tradition or that's very interesting. It's Jewish. Oh yeah? Yeah. All right. It's in like day Ask God what's his name, and that's the syllables. He just breathes. Just breath. So from the breath we learn to be satisfied, merely keeping ourselves alive. That's like low bar, <laughs> <laughs> right? From the external wind, we learn how to remain uncontaminated by the body and objects of the senses, both. Right? We'll get into this more. From the sky. What do we learn from the sky? Who knows? From the sky, what time is it? 10 minutes. From the sky, he learned how the soul, which pervades all material substances, is both indivisible and imperceptible. Soul cannot be divided, and it also cannot be seen by any material apparatus, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue hands, but you can hear about it and you can understand it through a process of anvaya and vyatarek, which means direct and indirect perception through spiritual knowledge. From water, he had learned how to be naturally clear and purifying, natural state of water. From the fire, he had learned how to devour all things without becoming dirty and how to destroy all inauspiciousness inauspicious desires of those who make offerings to him. So he would live detached and whatever was given he would take, but he would purify it like fire purifies anything that's offered to it. It's said that fire never becomes contaminated, even if it's burning a dead body. Fire is always pure. <clears throat> he also learned from fire how the Supreme Soul enters into every body and appears to assume the identity of each. Hmm? From the fire, so the fire is, it's actually, this is another Vedantic concept. There's pranamoy, the breath <coughs> god, and then there's agni, which means fire. And this is also considered, if you look at the Vedic treatises, that oftentimes agni is described as supreme, because it's also coming. The idea here is that nothing is separate 
because everything is coming. In Brahma Sanghita, it says that the cause and effect, because it's coming from the cause, it is also from that same essence or source. So the fire enters like the fire of digestion within every body and is present. And so within every body, actually, we are not alone present. That's why the foundation of everything is relationship. We are never alone. We think we are alone. This Avadut's wandering alone, but he's not alone. He's always with that supreme being within him. So in life, we are never alone. This is madness. This is illusion. This person is actually sane. Everyone else is mad. From the moon, he had learned how the various phases the body goes through, birth, growth, dwindling, and death, do not affect the embodied soul. That's one we can remember nicely. <clears throat> right? The moon goes through different phases. Now we're at Ikadashi, so 11th. It's waxing, and in a few days it's going to be the full moon, start of Kartik. But the moon actually is changing, or our perception of it is changing. So the soul is eternal, indivisible, imperishable, ever youthful, the, the most timeless, eternal substance like the sky and like the fire. It's within everything, present everywhere. But like the moon, even though it looks like we're going through phases of life, actually you're all just the same eternal being. And those who have eyes to see can see, oh, look at that beautiful form within each of us. Yes. What do we learn from the sun? So who has that? We should do a quiz after this. No, after a few days, we can see what we remember. <clears throat> Molly remembers almost everything. From the sun, he had learned how to avoid entanglement, even while coming into contact with sense objects. And he had also learned about the two different modes of perception based on seeing the real form of the soul and seeing the false designation. That's interesting. I guess the sun can see within. From the pigeon, okay, let's just stop with one more. <laughs> We're going from the moon and the sun and the sky and the fire and the air to the pigeon. We'll go into detail more afterwards. From the pigeon, he had learned how too much affection and excessive attachment are not good for one. So this is, we're not going to remember all these now, but actually in the verses, it goes into each one at length. This is just an overview. Imagine like, that'd be pretty cool. I guess the idea is that you can go outside and walk around and learn from everything around you. These are 24 examples. You know, so many things we can learn from. We can learn from Shesha. What can we learn from Shesha? To have great love and loyalty for her master, <laughs> right? We can learn this. The value of love, dedication, humility, also to try to protect, and defend, so many things. To not chase after deer <laughs> in the dark next to the trailer. <laughs> right, learn so many things. This human body, <laughs> we can learn that we have someone who's looking after us to protect us, right? Right, willing to do so much to protect us. There is someone out there in life who is always looking out for us. We can learn this also from Shesha. <laughs> it's true. This human body is the open door to liberation. If one becomes overly attached to material life, family life like the pigeon, one is compared to a person who has climbed up to a high place just to fall down again. Okay. <laughs> That is the end of that chapter. Let me go to the last verse. There's an, uh, so then the next chapter is going to continue these examples. Uh, let's go to the end here. There's a whole story about the pigeon family, which is kind of a sad story. Hare Krishna. So what do we remember? Um, what do we learn from the moon? 
Vrindavan. The soul is unchanging even when the body goes through change. What do we learn from the internal air? Mangala. Hmm? Yeah, good. And the external air is purifying. We learn so anyhow, so many things to learn, so many things we did and did not learn. <laughs> <laughs> The point is not learning here. <laughs> what else? All right. All right. Mani is ready. Let's go. Um, what do we learn from the mountain and the tree? With the outer air, though, it moves through anything smelly, but it never carries the scent. It always, like, it, it remains untouched. It might move through things. That's what I thought. That's good. Yeah. No, Krishna should add that one. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, I know. What do we learn from? Um, yeah, it's interesting that the air carries the scent, but it's also separate. Right. Mm. All right. How about what do we learn from? What do we learn from the tree and the mountain? Malini can answer again. She's no, someone answered. Jai Shri. Vrinda. Vrinda. The tree, I'll do the mountain. <laughs> I, I feel like we should do that song. How's it go? The mountain is, is no. Minerals. It's also just stable, right? So it's mm. not um, affected by changes that are going on now. Hmm. It's offering its life for the good of others, like the tree. Hmm. Trees protect and bringing up. Hmm. Tree brings up water. And makes <laughs> Everyone's creating their own thing. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm the tree and mountain give their life for service. Oh, yes. They, they use their whole yeah. kind of fire. <laughs> <clears throat> the fire? What does the fire do? The fire is able to... pure. Yeah. <laughs> Good. The fire burns karmic silliness. That's going to be the title of the class. It is silly, right? Yeah. Balaram, what did we learn from Shesha? <laughs> so much. That there's constant protection, constantly somebody looking out for. You know what I would say for that story? This is another story. Uh, Prodi tells the story of a cow and a tiger. And the cow wanders off and is looking, she, I don't know, I don't want to assume the cow's gender. The cow. <laughs> the cow goes and looks for water and she goes and sees nice green water and she, as she's going, she becomes stuck in the mud. And the tiger is searching and sees the cow and thinks, oh, it's stuck. It's in a perfect location for me to go and eat. And he jumps, lands right before the cow, also gets stuck. It's like a bog. In the meantime, the owner of the cow comes looking for the cow, who's lost, sees the cow, and tries to save the cow. Gets a rope, gets his friend, brings the cow out. The cow is very happy with his protector. And then the tiger is looking, oh, he's going to save me next. And he does a similar thing, gets a rope, gets him out, but it's very carefully with hunt and weapons, and now he kills the tiger. Because, and then he takes the skin of the tiger, takes the teeth of the tiger. So what, what was the difference? The cow had a relationship and was a sevak, and the tiger was independent, controlling, enjoyer. Ah, I will go and eat everything. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, we are all souls and we're all under shelter of the Supreme Soul, Supreme Lord. But according to our mood and desire, we can be under that shelter or not under that shelter. That is our choice. We can be the cow or we can be the tiger. So, all right. So let's, we're going to have Arati. Um, we, do you have to go? Can we do one? Okay. Well, we're going to do Arati and we're going to do one, at least one, two bhajans.
quickly after RT. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll go over it. I didn't have any time to prep at all, but uh, we'll go over some of the different ones. I think they're interest. They're very interesting. It's interesting that Krishna, and Uda, you know, Krishna brings this up immediately, and he talks about how we can find teachers everywhere, which is interesting. You know, there are many gurus. We think, oh, who is qualified to be a guru? It's like a moth is qualified. <laughs> Right? You can learn from a moth, that example comes. Pingala, a prostitute, was qualified. You can learn from her. Uh, we learn from the tree, we learn from the sun, we learn from the moon, we learn from the sky, we learn <coughs> from the earth herself, we learn from water, we learn from fire, we learn from the internal and external breath. So this is the life of a a sober person. The life of a sober person is able to be a student and find teachers everywhere. It's very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Those who are the most sober, the most elevated, they see their teachers in the most simple things. I am so advanced. Everyone is beneath me. Everyone should learn from me. But those who are very advanced see that, oh, this blade of grass is giving me a great lesson in love, humility, and service. Oh, look at this tree, a very humble tree, giving me so much valuable insight about tolerance, right? So we can learn from everything around us, and we have that learner's mentality, beginner's mind. Then we can absorb, and we can always be simple, innocent, like a child. And then we can always be, they say children, look how fast they learn. Because they're not calculating and judging everything, they're just absorbing like a child. They know, they don't know. And so they just learn. So we pray to always learn in life. And in this way, look at Arjuna and Krishna, how he learned from Krishna. Look at Uddhava and Krishna. He was open, so he learned. Hare Krishna, Vancha Kaupatri, Vasikripasana, Vivacha, Pritanang, Pavane, Bhavishna, Bhavana, Hare Krishna.